Hello everybody and welcome to tonight's live stream. We've uh, just, we'll get underway in a couple of minutes. Hopefully my audio is sounding good and uh, camera's looking okay. I'm set up inside tonight because it's a little bit cold outside. And uh, looks like we've already got a, a view on already. So yeah, welcome to tonight's live stream. And uh, what we're going to do tonight is we're discussing uh, repeaters, uh, repeater voting, simulcasting, and uh, that's using the VK Link uh, system, which is uh, an Australian cut down version of uh, All Star. Uh, All Star still works uh, with this. What I'll show you tonight, uh, but uh, yeah, for for what I'm showing, it's the uh, the cut down version that we're running here in Australia. So. Uh, what I'll do, be doing too is uh, be going through this presentation and uh, I'll be uh, um, asking for questions as I go through and uh, I'll just pause for questions every now and then. <clears throat> so before I begin too, um, don't forget if, you, uh, if you're viewing this in, uh, either live or later on on, on playback, uh, don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already done so and uh, the like button. And uh, if you yeah if you if you're considering uh, if you're enjoying this content yeah consider uh, consider subscribing. So there's a couple of thank yous that I want to do first before I go into uh, this presentation uh, this evening. Uh, the first one is to, to uh, Matthew Ka6SQG, and uh, a lot of this uh, theory in the presentation is actually from a presentation that Matthew did a few years ago and uh, he runs a simulcast system over in the United States. Uh, he doesn't use uh, this system exactly, uh, his is a little bit different but uh, essentially uh, the theory is all the same. So uh, big thanks to, to Matthew for that. And the other thank you goes to Joe, KC2IRV. Uh, Joe's uh, located uh, near Pennsylvania in the United States and he runs a simulcast system using this uh, on All Star. Uh, slightly different to how I did it, but uh, I learnt a lot from Joe, so uh, thanks uh, needs to, to go to him. He gave me a lot of ideas to do with uh, uh, the GPS locking and a few other uh, boards and, uh, and ideas. So we've got quite a few now coming in uh, to the stream. Um, I'll just reiterate again that I'll go through this presentation and then I'll, uh, I'll uh, be looking through your questions in the live chat. So uh, yeah, please uh, leave leave questions in the live chat. That'd be great. Okay, so let's uh, start up, start this up, and hopefully this works. So we've got voting and simulcasting repeaters using VK Link. So. Uh, uh, the other names for it are, are Asterisk or um, uh, App RPT or All Star, no matter what you want to call it. So when we're looking at repeaters, the main thing that we want is more coverage. So the first step to maximizing maximizing repeater coverage is you pick a good location. So uh, a lot of the times that uh, that is the case, but sometimes we're uh, limited to you know, maybe where we can place the repeater, we can't have uh, certain site agreements uh, state uh, what equipment we can put on on a certain site. So uh, sometimes uh, the, the best location is not always possible. So ideally we put the repeater where it can see all the users. Um, here in Tasmania, Australia, where I live, there's lots of mountaintops uh, that we can do this uh, in uh, built up areas, uh, cities and buildings. Um, at buildings and um, uh, high areas within a, an urban environment are good. And, uh, but, uh, but here where I live, there's quite a lot of mountains. So uh, we've got a, quite a, a bit to choose from, which is good. Um, lower frequency, that's always uh, a way to maximise coverage. So if, uh, instead of using uh, 70 centimetres or uh, 2 metres, uh, we can maybe go down to 6 metres uh, in some cases. But uh, of course, with using lower frequencies, there's uh, trade-offs associated with that. Um, yeah, so 
Again, using two meters, that's 10 dB better than uh, 70 centimeters UHF. Six meters, 20 dB better than UHF, so 100 times better. So again, penetration, foliage, the more direct paths, the lower you go. Uh, refracts and bends around mountains better than UHF. Uh, but of course, some of those trade-offs, as I spoke about, uh, the main one being size, uh, antennas get bigger, um, site restrictions, cavity filters uh, sometimes can be huge uh, when we get down lower in frequency. So to expand our coverage uh, from just one repeater system, generally what we do is we build uh, multiple repeaters. So uh, this was the case here. We built uh, multiple repeaters on uh, different frequencies and uh, uh, they're all dotted around uh, the state. Uh, users, they choose which uh, repeater uh, they want to use based on where they are. So for instance, uh, here where I live down in Hobart, uh, a user could, uh, could talk on uh, quite a few repeaters that are available. However, the conversation that they have on that repeater is restricted to the area that they're in. So they can't talk outside of, of that uh, area uh, due to coverage. So for instance, I'm here uh, in one city. If there's another city uh, 150, 200 kilometers away, I can't talk to, the, to that city because uh, the repeater coverage doesn't extend that far. So the next step to fixing that problem and extending our repeater coverage is, whoops, is that of installing multiple repeaters. So what we can do is uh, uh, build many, many repeater stations and then link them all together. So uh, we've got various ways of linking, uh, in-band linking with uh, remote bases. Uh, simplex RF linking, duplex RF linking, not going to get too much into those tonight. Uh, they're, uh, they're pretty uh, straightforward and, uh, and uh, a majority of linking is done that way. Uh, another one is linking to a hub repeater. So uh, again, here in, uh, in this uh, state, we had um, a lot of UHF repeaters and they all linked to a hub two meter repeater, which was the, the main um, two meter repeater up in the north. Of, uh, of the state here. So all of the UHF ones covered smaller areas and they all linked back into that hub repeater. The, uh, the other option is uh, VoIP, so Echolink, uh, IRLP, Allstar, and uh, in this case in Australia, VK Link. So there's many different ways to, uh, to link these repeaters together. So uh, what users do is, is they select uh, the, the correct repeater for their location. So they know their location, they know their local repeater that they operate on. And then that's good because then all the users become uh, part of that same conversation. We can link all the repeaters together and many different people can operate on their various repeaters and they can all tie in together. So that's where we get into, uh, into receiver voting. So. This is uh, another step up again, uh, different, uh, different concept. So rather than having uh, the user pick the right repeater for the area, you can let the repeater decide. So uh, the receiver uh, decides uh, which one it wants to, uh, uh, which one's got the strongest signal. So uh, a, 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 an ideal uh, scenario for this would be uh, balancing a system out by uh, if you have a, a noisy transmitter site, so we've, we've got a, a local broadcast site for television transmitters and radio. Uh, it's very noisy on, uh, for RF on uh, certain bands, so for instance, two meters and uh, six meters. You could install a, a transmit only uh, a site up there and have uh, your receivers uh, dotted around um, uh, various different locations. And you can fill in coverage gaps. So for instance, uh, on UHF, uh, buildings become a bit of a problem. Uh, you can dot uh, many different receivers around uh, the, the city on different buildings, and then you can uh, effectively uh, uh, fill in the gaps uh, that, that you'd otherwise have uh, by using just uh, one site. So what, then what happens is, is all of those remote receivers, uh, they all link back to uh, the repeater site and uh, you match the delay, of course. And uh, then what happens is uh, once they get back to the main repeater side or the transmitter side as it was, 
uh, the voter then picks the best uh, the best uh, signal. So it can do that in a couple of ways. Uh, it can uh, pick the first one to, to unkey. Uh, it can uh, some some voters send signal strength telemetry over a link uh, back to the main base station, or you can uh, use the more common noise or signal to noise comparator, which um, is uh, in in the amateur services the more uh, a common method of doing things. And it can do all of this on the fly and really quickly uh, in real time. Um, oh, one more thing is um, uh, about timing there. I, I mentioned about matching the delay. So um, all of the receiver, uh, all of the uh, audio from each one of those remote receivers, they need to arrive back at the same spot. In other words, the main repeater site uh, for evaluation at the same time because um, obviously there's no point trying to vote on a signal that's slower than another. So um, that uh, might uh, be an issue with IP, uh, but we'll look into how that's actually uh, handled with the, the system that we've got running down here. So um, with RF, uh, there is a little bit of a delay, but it's not as much as using uh, IP uh, as can be expected. Um, so I might just pause there. I might just check to make sure that this uh, that the streams are all working fine, and um, I'll uh, see if there's any uh, comments or or questions thus far. And uh, hello to uh, to Ed. Ed there. Uh, have I ever used a ten meter repeater? Yes, I have, and I actually uh, have built one. Um, there's uh, that is a, a two that's got two receivers, two voted receivers. And uh, that's running on 29.680 here in Tasmania using a 91.5 uh, hertz tone to access. So hopefully when the sunspot cycle uh, starts to get back up, we, we might see a bit of activity, but it's, uh, it's been rather quiet. But, uh, but yeah, so 10 metres is a very, very good band, uh, especially for FM. Uh, so it can be a lot of fun. And uh, good, uh, good evening to, to Scott there as well. I thought I'd add that one in there just to... See if you're paying attention. <laughs> VK4, VK4CZ, uh, uh, Facebook, check him out on Facebook and uh, uh, just pop in his call sign. Uh, lots of, uh, of great uh, content and photos on his uh, Facebook page, so make sure you do that. Okay, so back to simulcasting. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what about if we had... Uh, a situation where the user did not have to pick which repeater site they use at all. So um, a good example for this is uh, those who might not live in the local area, they might be visiting um, and they might, uh, they might just see one frequency in, uh, in, their, in their listing. Uh, what about if we had linked repeaters and they were all on the same frequency? Well, that'd help as well because then you wouldn't have to go through a big frequency list to try and find out exactly what frequency you're supposed to be on, what tones you're supposed to use and all those sort of things. What about if we use those two and then we combine them with receiver voting? So when we talk about simulcast, we're talking about uh, in, 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 overlapping, uh, in overlapping coverage areas, we're transmitting the same information at the same time. So um, just think about that concept for a minute as we go to, uh, to the next few slides. So one of those uh, advantages that I, or some of the advantages of the simulcast uh, system that I mentioned is that everyone gets to participate on the same conversation on the same frequency. So they can be, uh, in, uh, as, as long as they're in coverage, they could be on the same frequency as another user who could be using an entirely different repeater uh, elsewhere in the system. There's nothing to adjust as the user moves through or between coverage areas. So um, if you've got uh, a city on, on uh, one side of a mountaintop uh, or a valley is probably a good, uh, good example. And then you, uh, you're uh, mobile, uh, driving uh, maybe to another town or another city and you move out of coverage area of one site and you're moving into another. 
well then you uh, wouldn't have anything to adjust. You'd be on this exact same frequency and you wouldn't even have to touch your radio. So uh, as you, uh, it's just uh, continuous coverage from one repeater site to another. So uh, again, as I mentioned, visitors or uh, those uh, who are not familiar with the area, they've only got one channel that they need to use. And uh, this is very good too for those uh, in areas that uh, have issues with frequency um, allocations. So here in Australia, it's not too bad on uh, UHF, we've got quite a few allocations uh, free, uh, but on two metres we're starting to, uh, to find that we're running out of space. So especially in the United States, I know that uh, uh, frequency um, allocations and uh, making sure that there's enough room for everybody is a difficult thing. So it means that only one frequency would need to be used and uh, potentially uh, you could put uh, lots and lots of sites up on, uh, or lots of different repeater sites rather than using many different frequencies, you can just have the one. So what that ends up being looking like is uh, overlapping coverage forms a virtual repeater uh, coverage area. So it's larger than what can be achieved by any one single site. So no site is gonna cover a massive amount uh, of coverage. So if you have one city that's uh, uh, 100 uh, kilometres or uh, no, we'll, we'll use 160 kilometres or 100 miles away, you're not going to be able to cover that city and cover uh, the city that's in your local area where the actual repeater is uh, due to terrain and all sorts of other things. So you can build impossible repeater coverages and fill in gaps and shadows in valleys and, uh, and hilly areas. So, there is a catch with everything, of course. It's uh, up to now, I've been speaking like it's been really easy, but of course, uh, it's <laughs> sometimes far, uh, very far from it. It requires very precise frequency control. So at uh, UHF 400 megahertz, we're talking one hertz of error between each transmitter site. So one hertz is, uh, is um, Quite achievable now that we've got GPS uh, locked um, radios, and uh, we can uh, we can uh, make sure that the stability of uh, of these transmitters are also uh, within that specification. Uh, it also requires precise audio phase control. So our audios need to be exactly in phase and they need to be the exact same level. So they need to be matched at every transmitter. They have to deviate up and down at the same and have the same frequency response. So uh, each transmitter that's used in the system needs to be identical. Uh, if, we're, if we're linking via RF, so uh, all of the links from each site to each transmitter needs to have identical frequency or phase response as well. So if we think about, we've got uh, one receiver site and one transmitter site, and they're both, uh, uh, sorry, if we've got a receiver and a transmitter on one site, and we wanna link that to another one, then the link that goes to that secondary site needs to have exactly the same audio characteristics as each one of the different radios down in the chain. Because otherwise, if there's one that introduces some error, then it doesn't sound very good, and I'll, I'll uh, go into that a bit more in detail. So we're talking about overlap areas and, and errors. We're talking of 83 microseconds at one kilohertz, so that means that the time it takes for all of these audios to arrive back at each transmitter site, they have to be within 83 microseconds of one another. Now that's just from uh, those links to the transmitter. We also need to think about from the transmitter of each repeater site to the users. So if you're traveling in a, uh, between an overlap area, so when, if, we, if we talk about overlap area, this is a good diagram to, to um, illustrate this. These are our, uh, our repeater sites here with the antennas and we've got our, uh, our coverage uh, our coverage zone. So we've got green over here for this one and red over here for, uh, or X and Y for each repeater site. If we're in this zone here, this is the overlap area where both repeater sites overlap each other in coverage. If we're within this area, this is where the problem occurs. So due to the FM capture, uh, due to the capture effect on FM, 
whichever one of these is the strongest station, that will be the one that is captured by our receiver uh, when we're mobile or maybe even when we're at home. If we're in this coverage area here, we're gonna capture this transmitter. If we're in this coverage area here, we're gonna be captured by this one. So it's not a problem. If we're in this area here, the overlap area, that is the real issue. And that's where uh, I've been talking about this 83 microseconds. We need to make sure that the timing is correct because otherwise we'll get distortion, uh, we'll get uh, really bad audio, um, sometimes uh, carrier nulling, all sorts of things uh, can, can go on in this area here. So the speed of light uh, is uh, three kilometers per microsecond. So we can see that uh, we've got a, uh, a bit of a, an idea of how far um, we're, uh, we're, we're looking at here. So yeah, frequency needs to be so, con uh, frequency control needs to be so, so precise. So, um, uh, an example of this is if, if we stay within uh, 10 microseconds on the links back to the transmitters, the sites would have to be about 30 kilometers away, which is not really good if you want to build a really big system. So we need to delay the audio. So uh, I'll go into audio delays a little bit later on. But uh, um, we can also, this is also uh, an, an issue depending on what frequency you want to be on. So because of multipathing effects at lower frequencies, uh, direct paths are more common. So you'll create nulls at low band, uh, six meters, due to um, the physical wavelength size. So sometimes you'll need to offset the frequency so that they're not exactly on frequency, uh, each transmitter. However, on uh, 70 centimeters, uh, generally we, uh, we put them uh, both on the same, both transmitters on the same frequency. So I'm hoping that uh, that's, uh, makes sense. Uh, it, is, it is a little bit in depth. I try not to go into too much theory, but uh, that is the theory behind it anyway. So uh, that is the, the main issue that we have with building such a system. So a summary on that uh, of building a simulcast system is that we need to obtain match repeaters. We need to modify them to make sure that they can have an external frequency reference, so GPS locking or uh, using a uh, oven controlled crystal oscillator. Link all the repeaters to a central site uh, using uh, high quality audio, so RF or IP. And we need a signal to noise uh, voter to select the best receipt, uh, to select, that's a mistake there, to select the best signal going into each receiver and then send it back to the repeater sites, uh, transmitters. We need to put in audio delays in the return path to each transmitter. We need to tune and maintain the system and commercial systems like this are very expensive. So that seems like a lot of information to go through and it seems very complicated. Luckily, the system that we've managed to build is very, very simple and eliminates a lot of the hassle that we've uh, just discussed as far as um, uh, RF is concerned. Using IP is very, very, um, is very much easier than RF. So, this is our uh, is our system. So uh, the call sign of the repeater is VK7RTC, and it is a simulcast system. Currently, there's three repeater sites, and this covers two transmitters on simulcast, and there's three receivers in total. So one receiver uh, pairing with each transmitter, and then there's a single receiver uh, just uh, being used for a uh, a, a local coverage uh, um, hole that we've got. Uh, the, each site can uh, fail over if there's a uh, it can have a backup failover, so it can uh, they can operate as individual repeaters. If, uh, for instance, the um, connection bet uh, between each site, the IP connection goes down. Uh, each repeater is GPS locked, and the audios are also GPS locked as well, and they are all on exactly the same frequency. And uh, all of this is done on 70 centimeters on UHF, which I neglected to put into this presentation. Now, our repeater voting, the 
audio is split up into 20 millisecond blocks. So what happens uh, with our system is, is that we have uh, each, repeater, uh, each receiver, we've got three receivers. Uh, each uh, one has the audios come in and they're in 27, uh, 20 millisecond blocks. And what happens is our main controller then decides which one it's going to pick uh, to be the strongest signal. So all of this is done over VoIP and it's all done with audio processing and voting is done in software using VKLink or Allstar. And it is all connected via the internet using uh, low latency links of less than 50 milliseconds. So uh, you might look at that and think uh, 50 milliseconds, that's much more than uh, the, the microseconds that we need for timing. But luckily uh, we've got some delay in the boards that we use which uh, accounts for that. Uh, you can run this over LAN, so rather than having uh, this run over the internet, you can have private LAN links uh, running the same system. Uh, we don't have that in ours due to the fact that none of the sites are line of sight to one another, so we can't physically have a wireless uh, LAN link between them. So here's uh, a couple of photos of, uh, of our site. So on the left-hand side, we've got the main repeater controller. So... Uh, uh, for those who are watching this uh, from the United States that would be aware of Allstar, uh, basically Allstar runs on uh, the Raspberry Pi there uh, as a repeater controller, so all of your ID, all of your uh, switching and audio is uh, routed through that. That also uh, determines which um, one of the audios goes uh, out to each transmitter. Excuse me, and then on the right hand side, we've actually got one of our racks. So you can see here the repeater um, sitting in the top rack. Uh, this is a uh, an, an ex commercial system from uh, Australia, and uh, we've got our GPS on the next uh, rack down. In this case, here is the uh, the voting board and uh, and a GPS lock board for the voting board. So I've got a photo of that. Uh, in uh, further slides to come. And then we've got uh, routers and uh, other various bits and pieces in this particular rack. So that's our main uh, site one. This is uh, site two. So uh, this uh, secondary site, you can see that I've got the, the rack open here and you can uh, just see a glimpse there of the, the GPS, uh, uh, sorry, the um, voting board. So uh, all of our audios from the repeater go into here and. Uh, and they get, uh, they get mixed and transmitter audio out comes back into the repeater. And this is just a, uh, an oscillator board for, the, um, for this to, uh, to keep this stable because uh, this used a little 9.6 megahertz crystal and unfortunately it wasn't uh, stable enough so uh, we had to come up with a solution. But uh, I'll uh, go into that in more detail. So that's all, it all uh, in the rack and it's uh, not nice and neat. Uh, as I said, this operates on uh, UHF. So I'll just pause again and uh, look for some more comments. Activity seems to be inversely proportional to the number of repeaters there are. <laughs> yes, that's, uh, that's exactly right. Um, we uh, sometimes uh, wonder whether all the effort's worth it, but uh, as long as it gets some use, uh, that's the the main thing. And plus uh, amateur radio is all about experimentation anyway so all of this was experimental I knew nothing about it when I started with it but uh, gradually learnt over time and uh, now we've got a nice operational and stable system so it's uh, it's certainly uh, possible for uh, for those that are willing to learn. Okay so locking to GPS is the uh, is the next thing so <clears throat> We uh, we still have um, we still have uh, uh, issues with uh, with locking certain radios, but uh, luckily I found a way with the the radios that I use. Uh, their uh, their model numbers are KL four fifty. Australian viewers will know uh, exactly what they are. Uh, they use a MC one four five one four six PLL, and this is usually locked to a twelve megahertz TCXO. Uh, this only has uh, a spec of uh, 0 0.0005% or 2.2 hertz stability, which is not enough 
uh, for us for our purpose. So uh, in reality, they do drift around a little bit more than that. Uh, but uh, on uh, on UHF, we need less than one hertz. So we needed to make sure that uh, that, that was stable. So I needed to make it work with 10 megahertz. So the long story short was we managed to hack the PLL software and divide it down to make it work with 10 megahertz, 12 megahertz, and 14.4 megahertz. So we managed to get quite a few different references that would work. So I removed the TCXO and directly injected into its place from a GPS and it, uh, and it worked. So that was uh, a good thing. And the, uh, the GPSs that we use are uh, BG7 TBL units. Uh, they're cheap and uh, pretty good stability. And they also offer uh, on the front panel here one pulse per second, which we also need for our voting board for audio timing, uh, which I've got uh, more information on, uh, on the next slide. Uh, you can uh, see a review of this GPS on uh, KC2 IRV's YouTube uh, channel. I'll uh, place a, a link in the... Uh, in the cards uh, for those watching later on uh, to that uh, channel. But yeah, if you just do a search for KC2 IRV or a BG7 TBL, you'll find his uh, GPS review, which is uh, really good. So that's good. We've got all the radios uh, GPS locked, but we, we still have an issue. So all of the radios um, are needed. They need to send uh, audio back to the main site where the voting takes place and then it has to send it all the way back to the transmitter site again. So we have that delay problem and our audio won't be in phase uh, when it reaches the other end. So we need to put more delays in for that. We've got lots of antennas, we've got lots of cable, we've got time. Uh, if we were doing this uh, on RF, uh, that would be the case. So I was trying to find a solution to this. I wanted to, to, to look at uh, getting this solution implemented and that's when I found the All-Star uh, um, RTCM, RTCM and voting solution. All this operates over VoIP. It's a VoIP solution. It connects all the sites together uh, instead of using RF. Uh, the internet's easy. There's, you don't need lots of radios. You don't need lots of antennas for links between each site. Uh, it's all open source. Uh, the hardware is... Uh, um, been uh, designed back in 2011, so all of the information is still available on the internet. You can buy the modules uh, commercially, however they're $350 uh, Australian, so quite expensive and too expensive for me to purchase. So just two sites alone would have cost me over $700 Australian. So I uh, didn't want to pay that sort of money uh, for getting this up and running. Luckily they did build a prototype of this board. Uh, it's a lot bigger, but it is a lot more cost effective. And the uh, board information, uh, the Gerber files, the, uh, the schematics, everything was still available online. So it, operationally, it's exactly the same as the commercial version of the RTCM. It's only larger. I managed to get five PCBs made for $60 Australian. Uh, that included $130 uh, in parts for uh, every board, I think it was, no, sorry, yeah, in, in, uh, in $130 in parts per board, and built boards were about $150, so there's, there's a $200 saving there already, so uh, I was quite happy with that. Plus, I learned a little bit how it all worked. I managed to get it to, uh, uh, to work out how to program the boards, how to uh, modify them, and just generally how they worked and looked at some of the code as well uh, of the, the original uh, uh, developers, uh, Jim Dixon, um, uh, W6, uh, I've forgotten his call sign now, but if you do a search for Jim Dixon uh, voter board, you'll, uh, you'll find it on, uh, on Google. So each board interfaces to receiver, a transmitter or both. Uh, you uh, then connect uh, they all then connect to a host or repeater controller running running app RPT uh, using the Chan Voter driver for those that are familiar with that uh, under asterisk. Uh, and in this case, as I said, uh, running it under uh, a VK Link or uh, or Alt or All Star. So the VK Link system, I'll go into a little bit more detail uh, for those interested from Australia. 
So basically what VK Link is, is the cut down version of AppRPT or uh, AllStar to run smoothly on a Raspberry Pi 2 or 3, and I believe it now even runs on uh, some of the newer Raspberry Pi 3 Pluses or 3B Plus or whatever the latest model is now. Uh, it was developed and tested by VK3VS, VK7DB and myself. And the idea behind this was to find something that was relatively cheap, available and open source to connect repeaters across uh, the internet, across the country and make it work. So the main idea behind VK Link originally was to link repeaters that aren't being used very often around the country and they can be permanently linked, they could be linked on demand and uh, you can get all the telemetry uh, put back into a central uh, status page which is available uh, at uh, by going to status.vklink.com.au. So you can see here is an example of quite a few different nodes that we've got around Australia, uh, various repeaters and uh, also some uh, personal simplex nodes as well. We've also got um, a couple of restricted nodes. So here in Australia, six meters and 23 centimeters can't be used by foundation calls. So we have a, a restricted subset here. And uh, that was basically the idea behind it. Now, all of this is available for any uh, Australian uh, VK amateur who'd like to uh, build a node, I'd encourage you to do so. Have a look into it, um, even build a simplex node and uh, just set it up on your bench for testing if you like. And uh, and join in. So all the information is available at www.vklink.com.au. So how does VK Link work? Well, what basically happens is it's uh, a bunch of Raspberry Pis. They're all running uh, the software. They connect directly to each other over IP using one UDP port. Uh, audio is uh, routed in asterisk, which is the, the PABX in uh, built into AppRPT or AllStar. And uh, radio control is uh, done by the AppRPT and the various channel drivers. So, uh, for instance, uh, radios that are interfaced via uh, USB sound card fobs, uh, such as the one that I've modified here on the right, uh, they, uh, they run a, a channel driver which basically uh, outputs uh, audio uh, out of... Uh, the speaker output out of the USB dongle. Uh, there's a microphone in for audio coming in. And then there's a modified uh, section of these uh, pins here to allow for PTT and uh, mutes uh, switching. Now, the, the, the good thing about this was that VKLink uh, still had uh, the Chan underscore voter driver, so Chan voter driver, which we use for uh, the RTCM or the voting board. So that was great. I could use that straight out of the box using the existing system that I was already using for uh, simplex links and uh, repeaters already. So as I mentioned, those boards, uh, this is the uh, on the left, the RTCM board, uh, the commercial one, sorry, uh, in a nice uh, little box, nice neat package. Uh, and these are available from micronode.com. Uh, these will, if the, if these uh, to be run on simulcast, these do need to be modified. The same as uh, this board here. Uh, there's a crystal. This this one here, a 9.6 megahertz crystal, uh, needs to be replaced with a um, a more stable uh, uh, version. Uh, uh, sorry, a more stable uh, reference. And uh, in my case, uh, it's a GPX uh, locked 9.6 megahertz uh, 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 OCXO. Uh, KC2 IRV has got a lot more information using this uh, particular board here uh, or this unit. Uh, so you can check out his, uh, his site to, uh, and his YouTube page for uh, details on that. So putting it all together, so basically... Uh, a receiver plus an optional transmitter at each site with a, a voter board and a GPS attached to it. Uh, there's a master site which has a repeater controller uh, which is the host running uh, all-star, VK link, whatever you want to call it. The, uh, the GPS, the BG7 TBL, uh, TBL unit provides 10 megahertz for uh, each transmitter to GPS lock it. And then it also offers one pulse per second for uh, receiver audio timing, so to make sure that all those audios are in phase and uh, timed correctly. Now the audio sent from each receiver 
uh, at each site to the controller and then it sends it back out to all the transmitter sites at the same time and it's also adjustable so I can adjust it down to the nanosecond I believe. Now one thing uh, that is a question about this due to the fact that it's running over IP is what happens with latency. So what happens uh, with latency is that there is a buffer in the uh, driver, the channel driver. So what happens when you unkey, you may hear an echo uh, of the last syllable of your last transmission. So because it's digital and because it is run over the internet, we need that buffer there because otherwise um, all the, not all of the audios will arrive at the same time. So that's why that's in place. Um, yeah, so basically if that value is too low, we'll lose packets and we'll have choppy words and the voting doesn't work properly. If it's too high, then you get an unnecessary, uh, an unnecessary uh, long echo of your own transmission. So ours are set... Uh, fairly good now where you don't generally hear uh, your, uh, you may just, if you unkey really quickly, you may hear the last syllable of your last transmission, For the, but for the most part it works relatively well. Now I spoke about uh, simulcasting with the uh, voting board uh, using, or using that little uh, commercial version, uh, having to uh, remove that uh, 9.6 megahertz crystal. So what we actually did, uh, well, what uh, KC2 IRV actually did was come up with this uh, ingenious uh, idea. Basically, the uh, the pick on uh, those boards requires a stable frequency, and uh, that 9.6 megahertz crystal is only 25 parts per million. It's nowhere near stable enough. Uh, there was no way to be able to program the board to work at... Uh, um, uh, for, to work on uh, 10 megahertz. So we had a look, we tried, I had a look at uh, as many uh, bits and pieces that I could on uh, various uh, um, uh, forums and trying to get the pick to work, but it just wouldn't. So we had to build a PLL board uh, to, uh, to, to make that happen. Now KC2IRV, he was doing the same project, so what he did was he built a board off, the, off a Motorola design. And uh, he used a, uh, a GPS 10 megahertz uh, uh, reference to lock the, the voter board to 9.6 megahertz. So I won't go into too, too much detail, but basically what the, there's a comparator in here, uh, compares uh, um, and, and divides down 10 megahertz, compares it with uh, the OCXO and basically controls the voltage pin on this to uh, to make sure that this uh, stays on 9.6 megahertz on every single site. Um, okay, moving on. That is a... Uh, a photo of the board uh, mounted in the rack and uh, what that is is a uh, uh, the, the board in action on the left you can see uh, I've got uh, 10 megahertz coming in uh, in here which basically locks this and then uh, 9.6 megahertz out into this board which then uh, locks this on frequency and uh, the GPS uh, attaches uh, in here for the audio timing from that uh, that green GPS and uh, our audios go in and out here and we've got now a uh, connection to the outside world. Uh, you'll also notice a tone board in here too which uh, uh, all of our repeaters are tone switched so there is uh, a possibility for CTCSS to be run. Uh, the, the the great thing about using uh, this system is that you can monitor via uh, what they call Ormon. So uh, this is real-time signal strength data. So basically when there's a user talking on one of the repeaters and it's being received by one of the receivers, there'll be a bar graph which moves in real time um, and uh, indicates uh, uh, blue indicates uh, that 
Uh, it's a voting station, green. That's the one that is currently being sent out all the transmitters. And uh, we don't generally uh, have a non-voting mix station. So uh, basically that's what happens. And all of this changes in real time. So it's pretty cool. Uh, you can see uh, exactly what signal strength you're getting into the repeater. So, and, uh, and which one is uh, actually voting you, uh, voting you through. Uh, this is another uh, benefit um, of, the, uh, of Allmon, of the system. Yeah, you've got uh, the data of uh, how long it's been since you last re received a signal from the remote end. So, uh, for instance, in this case, this repeat is linked to uh, uh, one in the north of our state. Uh, it last received a signal from it about half an hour ago. Um, and, uh, and it's also got uh, connection details and what mode it's in and all those sort of things. We can also go into control panel and uh, change all sorts of features like timeout timers and all sorts of things uh, basically on a web page. So it's uh, very, very uh, simple and very easy. The other cool thing that you can also do is you can uh, record and view uh, voted data and audio in real time. So uh, we don't currently have this running because our Raspberry Pi uh, is a little bit underpowered when it does it. However, it is possible. So uh, you can see here, there's the 20 millisecond blocks that I said again of audio. Uh, you can see here that uh, if we drill down into this data a little bit, um, these blocks here, Mount Wellington uh, had the strongest uh, signal strength uh, all of a sudden, the mobile station started to drop down, 54. Uh, it then switched to, within 20 milliseconds, it switched to another site, which was Grey Mountain, 53. Uh, Grey Mountain signal strength come up, and then it must have dropped off again, and it started to be voted back into by, uh, by Mount Wellington. So pretty cool. You can really uh, drill down. You can also change modes as well to uh, just use one site, so you can physically listen to one site and see the signal strength of just one site. And uh, yeah, there's uh, there's all sorts of things. Uh, the only unfortunate piece uh, about this is it was written in Java and it takes a lot to get running. <laughs> but once it is running, it, it, is, it is a handy diagnostic tool. So this is our uh, basic coverage area. So those that are familiar with uh, with Tasmania would know this. Um, uh, this pin uh, shouldn't be there. We actually don't have a site there, but uh, um, the, the coverage uh, map is correct. So our two transmitter sites are these two here. They're on high mountaintops, and this is a fill-in receiver site for the main city here. So the green areas are uh, very, very good receiver coverage areas. Uh, yellow is uh, slightly, um, slightly down, um, not, as, not as strong. And then we've got some areas that are uh, completely uh, not covered at all. There are some inaccuracies in this modeling. This has been modeled uh, using radio mobile. Uh, for those that are familiar with that, this whole area is covered, but uh, it doesn't show that on this, uh, on this map. But that gives a basic uh, idea of coverage anyway. So the future of this system, uh, some of the things which, uh, but which could be done is uh, six meters could be uh, put onto the same system. It could be simulcast. It could be a very interesting thing to try. Uh, six meters is a very good band for um, long distance uh, local coverage. However, um, when sporadic E starts up and you start to get long distances, uh, stations who uh, might hear two repeaters that uh, maybe could be con some considerable distance away, may uh, have some ill effects with the audio. So a bit of an experiment, could be an interesting thing to do, but I just uh, uh, haven't had time to do that. Uh, again, uh, we could use the system with 10 meters uh, using just one transmitter and many voting sites. Uh, I mentioned earlier on in the, in the live stream, uh, someone asked a question about, uh, have I ever used a 10 meter repeater? Uh, our one uh, uses a, uh, an analog voter, uh, that's a Doug Hall voter. Uh, that one uh, is a two-site uh, RF linked voter system. Uh, so we could potentially replace that with this and, uh, and have it all running on the one system. 
Uh, another interesting thing, uh, our state of Tasmania, we could have uh, lots of different receivers dotted around the state and all tied back to a single controller. We could uh, also um, change this word. Instead of uh, diverse receivers, we could have diverse repeaters. So um, uh, an example uh, that I'm talking about is on six metres, we could have lots of different six metre repeater stations dotted around the state. They could all be tied back on the one frequency uh, tied back uh, to the same controller. And then, uh, for instance, when sporadic E opens up, if we've got a, a station who is uh, fading out of one, up one end of the state, but then fades into another, then uh, they, they, don't lose, uh, they don't lose coverage and, and, uh, and the contact can, cut, uh, can last longer. Uh, same two with 10 metres, same principle. And uh, the last one there is uh, expanding uh, UHF coverage so we can fill all the gaps that we've got around our, uh, our local state here. So I hope that that's uh, provided some sort of idea about the system that we use and um, uh, the different uh, um, ideas that uh, could be done with it. Um, as I said, it's not limited to just uh, what we've got running here. There's many different things that could be done with it. And... Uh, uh, it can be used also with All Star, so those uh, that already have All Star nodes can uh, can use this uh, uh, if they want. So that's uh, that's basically my uh, my presentation. I hope it wasn't too detailed. I'll go back to the chat here and see if we've got any questions. No questions. It's always a good thing. I might um, bring back. Um, I might bring up the uh, the real time page now and just show what it actually looks like now. So this is what it looks like. Uh, we've got um, we've got one repeater that's in use at the moment. And that's the the red one. There is actually a news broadcast on that one until nine pm. So if I click on uh, our repeater down here we can see that this lights up in green and tells us that there is a uh, that there is a repeater currently in use and it's been connected for 151 hours so that's pretty good and there's all sorts of uh, of different um, different information once that populates So again, uh, going back to setting up a, a VK link node, uh, if uh, you're based in Australia, all the information's on this website. Uh, there is a manual, uh, which is uh, pretty comprehensive, goes through everything from uh, from uh, basic setup through. So lots of uh, lots of information and how to do that. But uh, of course, uh, any uh, any uh, issues that you may have, you can always uh, can always ask uh, in the comments or. Uh, or send an email uh, in the contact us. So uh, yeah, thank you uh, to to Ross there. I hope that provides to some sort of uh, information on how our system works. Um, it may seem complicated, but uh, it's it's uh, it's rather simple really. Once it's all set up, uh, there's there's very little. There's a lot of configuration initially, but once it's all set up, there's uh, it's there's, there's not a lot that really needs to be done. That's good. I see that we had about uh, ten viewers on there tonight. Uh, I I think a lot of our viewers have been have been local. So um, that's uh, that's excellent. Thanks uh, for joining in there uh, for Peter uh, VK three YE. Um, don't forget to check out his channel as well. And uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, make sure you check out uh, VK4CZ's uh, 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 page. Thanks, Peter. Um, I hope that that all makes sense. Um, generally, with this sort of thing, it's a lot easier if you're uh, sitting down in front of it and you can see exactly how it all operates and, you, and, and you're at the repeater site and you can see... Um, how it's working, it's, it's a lot easier to figure out uh, what's actually going on. Um, I, I might be able to, I may be, I'll, 
Oh, no, I can't. I was going to log into the back end of one of the systems, but I can't. Um, what I might do is um, thank you for the comments to, uh, to Raymond. I hope that it's, uh, it's made sense. I'll log into one of the systems and show you some of the control that we've got, just purely from the perspective of um, the the normal ways of maybe doing uh, control is you know DTMF and all those sort of things. Uh, but uh, this is my um, this is my control panel that I currently have uh, options over. <coughs> Excuse me. So I can disable timeout timer. I can enable. Uh, timeout timer. I can also disable and enable incoming connections so those that are trying to connect to me. So that's good for instance in a broadcast uh, environment where uh, you're running a maybe a one hour news broadcast and uh, you want to mute uh, connections from coming in so you can do that. Uh, you can also view the node status, uh, the, the, the uptime. Sorry I'll make this window a bit bigger. Uh, see the uptime um, all sorts of things you can do here. You can make it say the time of day. But the more uh, interesting things are the, the simulcast. So I can actually turn off individual transmitters uh, really easily by just a touch of a button. I can uh, show the voter status. I can turn them all on or off for voting. So let's have a look at some of these. So you can see here that these are all... Oh, that's probably the wrong one. I should have used that one. So this is our node status, for instance. Um, a lot of this information is shown on the other page, but um, you can see here the uh, the, the tail uh, the timeout timer is currently disabled because we're in the middle of a broadcast, so that's all done automatically. Um, we've had forty three kachunks today, so that's an interesting one. We've had two thousand seven hundred and forty six kachunks since uh, system initialization, so. Um, it, it does register uh, um, very short kachunks or key ups, and there's been 179 key ups today, so over 14,000 since uh, the system was initialized. And uh, I think I only reset this a couple of months ago. It's, it's uh, don't think it, uh, oh, here's the uptime. Yeah, 2,042 hours. So um, that uh, gives some sort of indication of uh, how many key ups in that period. Uh, key ups does include uh, conversations, of course. So uh, it's been a couple of DTMF commands. Uh, you can see the last one. I tried to do a, a connection last week in the live stream, so it's recorded that. Uh, the transmit time today uh, it's transmitted for two hours fourteen minutes. So a majority of that's been the broadcast for today. So it's it's transmitted non broadcast traffic, uh, news broadcast traffic's been an hour, and. Uh, uh, it's been a total of 151 hours of transmit time since it uh, was initialized. So yeah, some pretty cool uh, stats that you can look into there to actually see if your repeater is being used, uh, for starters. I think this is what I was looking for. Yes, it is. So um, I can lock out certain uh, transmitters from being able to transmit. So they're all able to transmit at the moment. So that's, uh, that's what's uh, detailed in there. So uh, I think that's about it really for this uh, live stream. I hope that's uh, provided some sort of details, uh, some sort of detail. Uh, if you're watching this later on on, um, on playback, don't forget to uh, add a comment, uh, hit the like button if you enjoyed it. Uh, please subscribe as well if you haven't already done so. And uh, thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one.